Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and there are individuals in the Jewish world who have a profound passion for the Jewish people and the state of Israel, and who also are blessed with a unique insight and sensitivity, and with that rare ability to convey those insights to us through their writing and their speaking in a way that expands our own understanding and appreciation of Jewish life today. And lucky, lucky us. I have the enormous pleasure of welcoming back to JBS once again a friend and a very precious soul, Yossi Klein Halevi, journalist and award-winning author, whose 2013 book on the transformative Six-Day War of 1967 and the equally ground-shifting Yom Kippur War of 1973, which is just about to come out in Hebrew, has in three short years become a Jewish classic, and I hope all of you have read Like Dreamers, the story of the Israeli paratroopers who reunited Jerusalem and divided a nation. Let me remind you of some of Yossi Klein Halevi's background. Yossi was born in New York and was something of a right-wing radical in his youth, becoming a member of the student struggle for Soviet Jewry at the age of 12. Yossi got his bachelor's degree from Brooklyn College, earned his master's in journalism at Northwestern University, and as he grew older, his political perspective changed. And Yossi's first book, Memoirs of a Jewish Extremist, tells of his ultimate disillusionment with Jewish militancy. And much of Yossi's work today deals with reconciliation between Israelis and Palestinians. And Yossi serves as chairman of Open House, an Arab-Israeli, Jewish-Israeli center in the town of Ramleh near Tel Aviv. And in addition for writing pieces for virtually every American newspaper, magazine of note, Yossi Klein Alevi is also a senior fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, having made Aliyah with his family in 1982. And Yossi co-directs the Hartman Institute's Muslim Leadership Initiative with Imam Abdullah Antepli of Duke University. And Yossi, it is so wonderful to have you back at this table. Kola Kavod for all the work you've been doing. It just keeps Thank getting you. better and better. And the impact you're having is unestimable. So it's thrilling to have you in this chair again. Thank you. It's very good to be back with you. And Kola Kavod to you. Really, you're just growing the station and you're doing sacred work. Thank you very, very much. It's interesting to me. You wrote Like Dreamers in 2013. As we're sitting here together, we're approaching the 50th anniversary of the Six-Day War, which, of course, you wrote about. It is interesting to me that it is only now that Like Dreamers is being translated into Hebrew. Right. Summarize in a moment what the book's about. It tells the story of seven paratroopers who fought in the battle for Jerusalem in 1967. And then it tells the story of Israel from the Six-Day War, more or less till now, through these seven lives. Uh, one part of this group of se seven comrades in arms, an Israeli band of brothers, uh, one part became leaders of the settlement movement, uh, founders actually, very formative figures in the settlement movement. The other part became active in the peace movement, which of course opposes the settlements. So it tells the story of friendships, mm -hmm. friendships across the political divide, and friendships that in some cases were strained because of, of these tensions. But it took me a long time to understand this, but the, the main character of Like Dreamers is the state of Israel. And it is the, the more specifically, the fate of Israel's big dreams. Okay, but forgive me, I wanna make sure I understand you. When you say it took you a while to understand it, are you saying that 
you came to understand that the main character of your book was Israel in a way that you did not even understand when you wrote it? No, no. And uh, I, I worked for many years on this book, so I had a long time to, <laughs> to try to unpack this. And uh, it was only toward the end of the process. I'm talking about 10, 11 years of work. It's only toward the end of, of this very long process that it suddenly occurred to me that these seven men that I'm writing about, these seven soldiers, uh, are actually facets of Israel's personality. Mm -hmm. Each one represents another aspect of the collective Israeli personality. Incidentally, if you didn't see my discussion with Yossi about like dreamers, it's on our website. And we go into great detail about many things of the book, which is, it, as I said, it is already a classic. It came out in two, 2013. It won a National Book Award here in America. It was recognized as a groundbreaking look into not only the Six-Day War, but as Yossi says, an arc. He says till now, the book really went up to 2013. And it went through the Yom Kippur War. If you haven't had a chance to watch Yossi discuss the book, it's on our website. Go to jbstv.org, go to L'Chaim, and you can find Yossi Klein Halevi discussing Like Dreamers. I'm curious to know, as we approach the Six-Day War, first of all, do you remember it personally? You lived it. Oh, yeah. Yes, I mean, where I was, were you? I was, I was, I was 14 at the time. You were still a, you were still a right winger. I was still a right winger. I was a member of uh, Beitar, the right wing, uh, which grew out of Menachem Begin and Jabotinsky. Menachem Begin and Jabotinsky, and uh, and I um, and then I was a, I graduated to uh, the Jewish Defense League of Mayor Kahana when I was a teenager. And in 1967, I was 14, and my formative Israel experience uh, was like many. Uh, of our generation was watching the news every night and seeing the news tighten around Israel and this feeling that it can happen again and this sudden realization of how much Israel meant to me without ever having been there. And a few weeks later, after the war, my father, who was a Holocaust survivor, and had two brothers who had survived the war and were living in Israel, and he hadn't seen them since the war, says to me, we're getting on a plane, we're going. And, and there was this sense in the Jewish world, and I'm sure you remember this, Vividly. Of, of, of being overwhelmed with Israel's victory, Israel's existence. And that was the moment, I think, when world Jewry discovered Israel. Okay. And I want you to address that question exactly as you have now framed it. What was so unique about the experience you and I and virtually all of American Jewry shared as we worried about the existential existence of Israel and then how we felt right. as we came out of the war? So uh, again, I'll speak personally, but I, I think that, that my experience was generational. Uh, I experienced a series of shocks in May 1967, in the weeks leading up to the war. The first shock was watching crowds on, on the TV news, demonstrators in Arab capitals, chanting death to Israel, death to the Jews, and holding these big placards imprinted with skulls and crossbones. And, and when I was re researching like dreamers, I, I actually found the photographs of these demonstrations with the skulls and crossbones. And so the first shock was that the genocidal impulse had not been exhausted by the Holocaust. It had, the, 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 the way that I, I think about it today is that there are two miracles of survival uh, from related to Auschwitz. One is that the Jewish people survived, the other is that anti-Semitism survived. And for anti-Semitism to survive the Holocaust uh, proves the, the extraordinary resilience of this force. And so May 1967, we're seeing that this, the genocidal threat to, to the Jewish people has shifted from west to east, 
It's moved from Europe to the Middle East. That was the first shock. The second shock was realizing how alone Israel was. And I remember my father said to me at one point, don't worry, France is our ally. And this is before the days of the strategic relationship between Israel and the United States. That relationship develops as a result of the Six Day War, when America realized how powerful Israel is, and maybe we should start paying attention to this country. And, and in the days before the Six Day War, we did not have a, relation, a special relationship with America. Our weapons were all coming from France. Our bullets were French. Our planes were French. And suddenly, France imposes an arms embargo on Israel at our most desperate moment. The United States, which had promised Ben-Gurion, Eisenhower had promised Ben-Gurion in 1957, when Israel withdrew from the Sinai Desert after the 1956 war, Eisenhower promised that if Egypt ever shuts down the Straits of Tehran, which is Israel's southern shipping route to the east, the US will lead an international flotilla to break the Egyptian blockade. Abba Iban, the foreign minister, goes to see President Lyndon Johnson, who was a true friend of Israel. And Johnson is very regretful. He says, I'm fighting an unpopular war in Vietnam. I can't risk another war. And so Iban comes home empty-handed. President Gamal Abdul Nasser of Egypt uh, orders the UN peacekeeping forces to leave and they leave without any deliberation in the Security Council. And you know, in my innocence, I had assumed that peacekeeping forces are in place for exactly that kind of moment to prevent a war. And yet Nasser tells them to leave, and they leave. So Israel is, is, is left exposed to a genocidal threat. No allies. Nobody's coming to Israel's aid. And that's the moment when, when the Jewish people experiences, I think, the most profound uh, unity that we've experienced in our history, maybe since the revelation of Mount Sinai 3,500 years earlier. I don't believe the Jewish people was ever as united as we were in May 67. And you spoke about a kind of an emotional trajectory that begins with this fear for Israel's existence. It then turns to relief on June 5th the first day of the war when we realize Israel has taken the offensive. We don't yet know the extent of the victory. And then it turns to euphoria on the morning of June 7th, 1967, when the paratroopers reach the wall and there is this tremendous sense of a restoration of wholeness to, to Jewish life. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Abba Iban. His was the voice of Israel at the United Nations. Yes. Do you remember that? Sure. How eloquent he was and how he, I was so proud of him. I get chills just saying it. Um, and all of Israel seemed, there was something noble and gallant mm -hmm. in it. Is that fair for me to say? Sure. And when the war was over, as euphoric as we were, there was something about it that, that picks up this midrash about how God tells the children of Israel on the other side of the Red Sea they're not supposed to celebrate the Egyptians drowning. Yes, they're the enemy, but they're still human beings. And there was this sense that I had that Israel was sorry it had to do what it had to do, but it had to do it. And you know, they, they, this book came out the seventh day it was a diary of Israeli soldiers during the Six Day War, and the compassion they had for the Arab world they were fighting. And it was, Nasser was into pan Arabism, and he was going to be king of the entire Arab world. And they were fighting Egypt, and they were fighting Syria, and they were fighting Jordan. But there was no, there was no uh, arrogance to the victory. That's how I remember it. Do so I have, a different I have a different memory. So tell me. And um, what, I, what I experienced in Israel that summer, and that was the, my first trip to Israel, and it was a, a magical summer in so many ways. And I think the reason that I eventually moved to Israel was because I fell in love with Israel. It's, it's, it's like you fall in love with this beautiful 
young woman, and, uh, and then she ages. But you're, you know, you, I, I fell in love with Israel when she was 19 years old and, and had just won, won the beauty pageant. She was, she was, Israel was the queen of the world in the summer of 67. And uh, everybody was amazed at Israel. And we did fall into the temptation of hubris. And, and I remember seeing it in, 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 in many ways. One was uh, a joke book that came out in Israel of making fun of, of the cowardice of Arab armies. Now that's something that would never be done in Israel today. Because in Israel today, we have, I'd say, a fairly healthy respect for, for our enemies. But we did not in 67. Uh, there were jokes about Egyptian soldiers who, who threw off their boots in order to be able to flee on the desert sands. Uh, very cruel jokes. Uh, there was a sense of, of invincibility that Israelis Absolutely. indulged in in the summer of 67. Uh, the slogan, Kol HaKavod L'Tzahal, All Honor to Tzahal, which offended religious Jews. You know, what do you mean all honor to the Israeli army? God had nothing to do with our victory. You know, this was part of the argument that was going on. And, and the victory albums, now that came out. Oh, I, 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 I'm a hair surprised. This was Israel's first real victory. It, it had won a war of independence. But it was a costly war, and it was certainly not what Israel wanted the result to be. They were about to be annihilated. Incidentally, there are those who say now, behind the scenes, mm -hmm. Israel's victory was a foregone conclusion, if you understood the military. Uh, I, don't, I don't buy that. OK, but you've heard it. Yes, okay. I've, I've heard it. And what that, what that argument misses is that the, what it took for Israel to win was nothing less than the mobilization of the entire society. Israel came to a standstill through, through, from mid-May until the war. You had hundreds of thousands of young men in uniform. Uh, the streets were empty. Uh, the economy came to a standstill. Uh, on, the, on the Arab side, they were able to continue the life of their societies and mobilize their armies uh, without it impacting too seriously on, on their life. So, so it's, it's not a fair comparison. Uh, and Israel can't sustain that level of mobilization without risking the collapse of, of the economy. I, I understand the point. But, and, and look, I agree with you. I agree with you that it's understandable why Israel yeah, has reacted uh, that way. In my mind, you're being unnecessarily hard on uh, Israel. I'm giving you, I'm giving you the, the um, I would say the fairly conventional Israeli understanding today of, uh, of the mistakes we made in the summer of Oh, 67. there were mistakes made. But, there, but that doesn't mitigate all of the extraordinary empathy that existed. And I remember that vividly. And Yitzhak were being going to Mount Scopus, and they're going to say, Kaddish, that was, that, was a Arab. that was a beautiful speech. I mean, they're, they're, yes. Those are moments that you don't normally yes. see in conquering armies. And yes. there was something. And by the way, there was a, this hope. I remember. It I just turns, think, it I just turns think out, we shouldn't overdo sorry, the self-congratulation. Self no, I can't do <laughs> I think the pro, there, I think problems developed. I think. I think there ultimately was an over degree of confidence, and we didn't understand who the Arab world was then. I'm not sure we understand it now. This notion that every Arab is really was thrilled at what had happened in the Six Day War, and I'm there also very soon after the Six Day War. And the ethic is look at how happy the Israeli Arab is everywhere you go. And the West Bank had not become yet an issue. Mm -hmm. That's so I'm, true. Uh, so I'm, That's true. You know, you know let, me, let me tell you something that one of the, the characters in Like Dreamers said to me, Rabbi Yol bin Nun, who was one of the founders of the settlement movement, a very thoughtful man. He said um, the euphoria in 1967 was exaggerated, and the depression after the Yom Kippur War was also exaggerated. Mm -hmm. And he said, I was not euphoric in the summer of 67, and I wasn't depressed 
after the Yom Kippur War. Mm -hmm. And there's something in the Israeli character that lends itself to a kind of a manic depression. We're either on the verge of redemption or on the verge of destruction. Now, if you think about Israel's experience, here, let me suggest to you a few dates to be paired together. 1945, 1948. 1945 is the lowest moment in Jewish history, the abyss. 1948, the founding of the state, is one of the highest points. May 1967, the Jewish people is in the grips of life and death an angst, fear. June 1967, we're in the euphoria of redemption. Take another set of dates, June 1967 and then October 1973, the Yom Kippur War. We go from, again, from the heights to the depths. And this, there's this sense of where, in, in some way, the Jewish experience of the 20th century was, bi, was a bipolar experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, the, the extremes were, were, mm -hmm. were, were too vast. And, and, and I think that we, as a people, uh, have not recovered our balance, mm -hmm. and, and which explains the hard left and the hard right, where, where we are a, a people that, it, for very understandable reasons, is fundamentally out of balance with itself. And that, I, if, if, if the Jewish people was a patient at lying on, 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 on a couch and, and, and told the story of these, of these experiences of, well, at this moment I thought I was going to be destroyed, at that moment I was, the, I was on top of the world, uh, I, I think we'd know what the diagnosis right. would be. But wait, the Jew always is saying the sky is falling. Always. Sometimes it actually does. That's the problem, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Okay, talk also about the extent to which world Jewry changes as a result of the Six-Day War, not simply the state of Israel. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Let's start with, uh, with the most dramatic change of all, uh, the, the Jews of the Soviet Union. Fabulous story. And so until the Six-Day War, the Jews of the Soviet Union are known by Jews outside the Soviet Union as the Jews of silence. That was Elie Wiesel's. Uh, the title of, of his book that he wrote about Soviet Jewry, which he published, I believe it was in 1966, just a year before the war. And then this radical transformation happens to young, assimilated Soviet Jews who had no sense of, of, of Jewish history, who had been denied the most basic knowledge of Judaism by the Soviet regime, this policy of relentless enforced assimilation. And suddenly there is, the only way I can describe it is as a miraculous awakening of Jewish pride as a result of the Six Day War. Natan Shuransky writes in his book, Fear No Evil, mm -hmm. his, his, his autobiography, that uh, when he heard that the Temple Mount was in the hands of the Israeli army, he said, I was thrilled even though I didn't know what the Temple Mount was. And so something happens where the Jews of the Soviet Union have this sudden infusion of Jewish pride. That's the first miracle. Yes. The second miracle is that young Jews begin to openly revolt against the policies of the Soviet Union, the anti-Semitic policies. In the middle of the war, a young University of Moscow student in Yasha Kazakov writes a letter, an open letter to the Kremlin, I hereby renounce my Soviet citizenship and I, I, I'm applying for Israeli citizenship. Nobody spoke that. You don't, it, it, this was the Soviet Union. You, you, you don't speak to the Kremlin in that language. They didn't know what to do. And so uh, Kazakov, very sav savvily, if there is such a word, uh, gets in touch with the uh, correspondent in Moscow of the Washington Post, hands him a copy of the letter. The letter is published in the Washington Post, and the next thing we know, Yasha Kazakov lands in Israel. And this begins the process mm -hmm. of emboldening other young Soviet Jews. It, the fact that there are a million and a half immigrants from the former Soviet Union in Israel today, and something like a half a million uh, immigrants 
from the Soviet Union in this country is a direct result of 1967. Mm -hmm. We would have effectively lost three million Jews at the largest surviving com Jewish community in Eastern Europe after the Holocaust, if not for the Six Day War. So it was this amazing moment of retrieval. Now, if you look at what happens to American Jewry, and this is, this is a story that, that we both experienced, that sudden transformation of a community that wasn't sure if it's holding its head up high enough, whether, whether it's being too loud. It had all of the complications, the psychological uh, inferiority complexes of a minority. The Six Day War is the moment when American Jews paradoxically become not only better Jews, but better Americans. They start to feel self-confident. I was at APAC Policy Conference uh, just, just the other month, and it was a stunning experience to see 18,000 people in the Verizon uh, Stadium with, with and I, I was backstage, and I was watching how this thing works, like clockwork. And I thought, you know, there has never been a diaspora community in history that was as self-confident in projecting power as the American Jewish community. And that dates as well from June 1967. Well, you say it so perfectly. It is remarkable. The Jew had a very different self-image. And it's interesting, when I teach it, I use two photographs. There is a photograph of a Jew in a kaftan, and he's walking down some street in Poland. Mm. He's got a Talmud under his arm, mm. and he's bearded and in black. And if somebody said, what's the image of the Jew? In many ways, prior to 67, that was the image of the Jew. Mm -hmm. And after 67, if you ask, what was the image of the Jew? It was either the Life magazine photograph of the Jew, the Israeli, crossing the Suez Canal with the rifle mm -hmm. over his head, mm -hmm. or this fabulous picture that graced a book called Israel Today of a female Israeli soldier with an Uzi on her back and a, a swath of bullets across her chest with the most engaging, loving smile. And the Israeli suddenly was not an old Jew studying in a yeshiva. It was a young, vibrant Israeli. Do you remember the poster of uh, the Chassid going into a phone booth and yes. exposing yes. his shirt, and there's a Superman costume yes. under it. Yes. In, uh, I, I grew up in Brooklyn, and in my doctor's office in Flatbush, there was a full wall-sized poster of Moshe Dayan in the waiting room. Yes. Now, it's inconceivable today, but in, in, in the summer of 67, that seemed like a Absolutely. perfectly normal it Jewish wasn't, response. And it this was. This is a doctor's office. I, but, but we'll <laughs> say it. It was appropriate in some way. Yes, yes. Nobody was upset. Nobody yeah. said, um, that is, you've described so wonderfully why the Six-Day War was transformative in not only simply Israel, the Jewish world. Now I want to go to the flip side yeah. because it begins a problem. Mm. And the issue is all of a sudden we have territory on which Palestinians are living. Mm. I, they're in the process of transforming themselves from Arabs to Palestinians. And on the one hand, we had the Golan Heights. And there was a real feeling that the Golan Heights had been used by Syria to throw rockets into the Hula Valley, and we could not allow the Golan Heights to go back into Syria's hands. And there was a question what we do with the Sinai. But the real issue was, what do we do with what, what is called the West Bank? And people should understand, the name West Bank refers to the piece of territory in relationship to the Jordan River. It's on the west side of the Jordan River, and it comes up to what Israel's border is, after the 1949 armistice lines. And the question was, 
what do we do with that piece of territory? Mm -hmm. And it's 50 years later. You and I have seen, and again, you were much, we were both much younger. I want to hear how you felt about it, if there's your own journey, whether you've had different feelings about what Judea Samaria West Bank was and what we should be doing with it. But initially, there was euphoria because in the West Bank, there was the old city of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And we now had the old city of Jerusalem. And there are people today, by the way, who go to the Western Wall and don't realize they're on the West Bank. Mm. And then the question is, do we want to keep all the territory? And as history has unfolded, people know the end of the story. The end of the story is Israel is still there. And it went from liberation to administration to occupation. Whatever Israel was doing has been given different names mm -hmm. and different times, and those names have a valence to them. So now it's not about liberation. It's not about administration. It's about occupation. And we've been occupying for 50 years. My first question for you in this area is, do you remember what Levi Eshkol, he was the prime minister in 1967, what Levi Eshkol's attitude was about the West Bank? Well, he didn't believe that we would stay there. I don't think he believed we would stay there for 50 years. He, did, By the way, did he want to keep it? Absolutely not. He did not want to no, keep it. Of course it. not. By the way, did he offer it to the Arab world? Did he offer it back? He offered, um, it's not clear. It's not clear how much he offered. He did not offer all of it. He certainly didn't offer Jerusalem. He, he didn't offer the Golan Heights. He did not off offer the old city of Jerusalem. Right. So, and uh, Jerusalem. But he, he was prepared to withdraw from the West Bank. From the vast majority yes. of the West Bank. Yes. And he said to the Arab world, you can have it back. I only want one yes. thing in return. Yes. I want you to stop the, I want you to say it's over. Yeah. That this war, it's really a battle. Israel has been in a war since 1940. Eight, mm -hmm. and there have been battles. Mm -hmm. Sixty-seven no, was a, a battle in a yes. long, going, that's, ongoing that's, war. That's a good way to put it. And so Levi Eshkol says to the Arab world, "Just say it's over. Mm -hmm. The land is yours, and we'll live in peace side by side." Most people do not know the word Khartoum, and they don't know what came out of Khartoum. Well, the Arab League meets in the summer of 1967 in Khartoum. It was the last week of August. Mm -hmm. And on the 1st of September, what happens? Well, the Arab League, first of all, comes out with a statement. Yes. And the statement says, is the three no's. No recognition, no negotiations, no peace. And the Israeli public paid attention, even if the rest of the world didn't. And um, there was uh, one of the leaders of the settlement movement, uh, a guy named Yosef Ben Shlomo, a professor of Jewish philosophy who died not long ago, uh, said that um, he had initially been on the left, but when he, uh, when he saw the three no's, he figured, well, that's the answer, and we might as well, if they're, if they're denying our right to any of the land, we might as well claim all of the land. Now, I personally resonate with that. I certainly resonate with it emotionally. Uh, Are you talking now the, or then? Now, now. And what about then? You know, I, I think that I had a very schizophrenic attitude when I was a uh, teenager in early 20s to the whole question of the territories. Uh, on the one hand, when I was, when I was uh, 13, 14, and I was a member of the Beitar youth movement, uh, I wore around my neck a, a, um, a map of uh, the ideal land of Israel, according to Jabotinsky. Both sides of the it Jordan. It was both sides of the Jordan. It was a silver map. And, uh, and, that's, and I wore that for years. Did your father you know? approve? Um, he didn't disapprove. I, 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 he's my, a survivor. He's a survivor. My father was a, a, a very pragmatic person. And, what was his and, name? And uh, Zoltan was Hungarian. And, uh, and my father's sense of, uh, of the conflict developed as well. And I remember at one, he, died, he died young. He was 59, and he died in 1978. But I remember having a conversation with him 
shortly before he died, and he, talking about the Palestinians, he said, you know, this is not a good situation. Something's going to have to, we're going to have to do something with these people. And, and you said? Um, I listened. I listened. Uh, I, I was never a, a, an enthusiastic fan of the settlement movement. Even when I wore that map, you know, it was somehow, it was more theoretical. And I had those questions very early on. And um, a friend of mine who's, who's a settler and is very angry at positions that I've taken said to me not long ago in this very accusing way, you were never for, for the settlements. And I kind of saw that as, uh, yeah, that's right. And, and, and uh, if not a compliment, certainly a statement of fact. And, and He I, didn't mean it as a compliment. No, he did not. Yeah. And, and uh, my, my sense of the problem of the settlements is that in theory, they're right. In theory, it belongs to us. No people has ever returned to its land, the, its, its territorial heartland, in a more legitimate way than Israel did with Judea and Samaria in 1967. A war that we didn't provoke, a war of attempted destruction. And so I have no apologies for, for us being in that land. We offered several times to withdraw, and each time the offers were, were rebuffed, and those offers continued in the year 2000 and 2008. And, and I, I wish we continued to put the offer on the table. I think we need to, to actively put a, a peace offer on the table. It's Symbolically what, or for a real purpose? First of all, because we are commanded to be a people that pursues peace. Bakesh shalom veradfehu, seek peace and pursue it. And if you ask yourself why pursue, why isn't seeking peace enough? Why does the Torah have to add and pursue peace? For me, it's, 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 it's meant for a time like this when peace is so obviously elusive and, and, and perhaps unattainable. And not our, I don't believe it's primarily our fault. I, I think that if we put the best offer on the table, the Palestinian leadership would continue to say no because they cannot come to terms with our existence. And, and, and they can't give up their demand for refugee return from the descendants of refugees from 1948 to the state of Israel, which no Israeli government would accept. But so first of all, we're commanded to, to pursue peace and we need to keep for ourselves, we need to keep our integrity as a people committed to peace above all other considerations, including claiming land that is ours by historical right. The second reason, I think, is, um, is practical. Uh, we, th there is no reason for us to be on the defensive in our relationship with the Arab world. There's no reason for us to be judged as, as the obstacle to peace when we've made repeated offers in the past and we know that those offers would, would once again almost certainly be rejected. So just for practical reasons, I think we need to, to shift the onus of responsibility back where it belongs, which is on the Palestinian rejectionist leadership. Okay. I know what people who disagree with you would say. And they would say- From which side? <laughs> you seem at the moment critical of the Israeli government for not doing enough for peace, while you at the very same moment say, I don't believe that whatever we did would have a positive result. That no, is oh, no, I'm not saying that. It, no, no, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm not saying it wouldn't have a positive result. I think it would have positive results. It will not bring us peace but it can help change some of the language, some of the, rela some of the attitudes in the Arab world. Look at what's happening in the Arab world in relation to Iran right now. We are beginning to see shifts in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states we've never seen before. The Saudi media is, 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 is beginning to offer positive images of Jews and to counter 
decades of the worst anti-Semitism that came out of, out of the Arab world generally and the Saudis in particular. So we're, we're at a moment where, where attitudes might be shifting and we can help. It's, it's a very long-term process. But I would like to see us not, not come up with bills in the Knesset to, uh, to, to muzzle the, uh, the call to prayer from mosques. That's an unnecessarily provocative law. I would like to see us uh, not threaten the status of Arabic as the official second language, which is something that, that, that Ben-Gurion enshrined into law. So these are unnecessary provocations. Do I believe that the reason there isn't peace is because of us? No. It's because of a rejectionist Palestinian leadership. But I want to shift the onus unto them. So I have a practical reason, but I also have a moral reason. If we are a people committed to peace, we need to sound like a people that believes in peace. Even if we don't believe in peace now, and that slogan, peace now, I think is a disaster. You know, no country in the Middle East enjoys peace with its neighbors. Israel is going to be the only country in the Middle East to have peace with its neighbors. It's, it's ludicrous. And that's why the Israeli left uh, is, is in the sorry electoral state that it's in. It's why Israelis don't trust the Israeli left, because they sound foolish. They sound naive. You can't be naive in the Middle East. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that we need to sound like brutes. And, and sometimes, some of the voices that come out of parts of the Israeli government uh, are, are, are embarrassing to me. Uh, not what are, the, what, are the, what are the Gentiles going to say. I don't mean embarrassing in that way. I mean, what are, what are my kids going to say about who we are as a people? Really, do, do we really want to... To, to, to have a defense minister who, um, who talks about 20% of Israel's citizens, uh, Arab citizens, as a fifth column. Is that really uh, the, 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 the face of, of Israel to itself? Never mind the rest of the world, to ourselves. How do you self-define now? I mean, you were very clear at one point you were pretty far right. Mm -hmm. And then you, you, know, you saw the light in some degree. The question is, when you saw the light, how far center or left do you feel you've moved? Oh, I never, met, I never went left. You're center, aren't you? Yes. Okay. Yes. And what do you feel, as somebody who is in the center, that you feel does not represent the overwhelming majority of the Israeli people? I think, I think that, that a majority of Israelis today actually are centrist. Would, I said an overwhelming majority. Would you go that far? No, not anymore. I would have said so maybe five years ago. The polls show that the a position that I would regard as centrist uh, uh, is dropping. So it is majority, but not overwhelming anymore. It's, give it's, me, can yeah. you give us an example of something which you would feel if, they, if, if the polls showed this, or if people argued this, I would still think we're all centrist. Uh -huh. But instead of saying this, they're now saying this on the right. What? So here's, so look, what, what um, the positions, the, first let's define a centrist position. For me, the Israeli center is a combination of left and right. A, a centrist Israeli is left wing in, in that he or she sees uh, occupying another people, and I use the word occupation very deliberately in relation to the Palestinian people, not in relation to the land. Jews are not occupiers in Judea. We are native, we are indigenous to Judea and Samaria, and for me it's Judea and Samaria, it's not the West Bank, and it's certainly not occupied territories. But there's another people there, and a centrist would say, along with the left, that this is not good for Israel to be ruling over another people, a people that doesn't want to be part of our society okay. and whom we don't want Let's to be part of Let's take it piece by piece. I think the overwhelming majority of Israelis say that. I, that I, it's I not wish it were true. That it's not Not good. anymore. I want to it's going okay. down. Okay. That so it's not place. good for Israel to be there. It's one thing if we have to be there. It's, it's, not, I, a, it's not an overwhelming majority anymore. I, and they I mean, say it's, what? It's not... It's, that no, it's ours, and no matter what, we're, it's over. 
when you say it's over, these same people you're talking about, if they believed that there was some kind of miracle and that there was a transformation of Palestinian leadership and all of a sudden there was none of this nonsense on PA TV and they stopped naming streets and they stopped naming It would be a bigger majority. It would be a bigger majority, but it wouldn't be the overwhelming majority. And look, I used to say the same thing. 70, 80 percent of Israelis Absolutely. would support it. Absolutely. I'm not convinced, but let's leave that aside. The, um, the, the other part of a centrist yes. position is right wing, which is there's no chance of reaching an agreement anytime soon with the Palestinian leadership because they don't accept our legitimacy. And so if you can put it another way, a centrist position is I need a Palestinian state to keep Israel Jewish and democratic. I need a Palestinian state, but there's no chance of it anytime soon. So what do we do? Well, that's the question. The first thing I think we need to do is begin to change the way we project ourselves in the Arab world. And, and I'm very hawkish militarily. I think we should have bombed Iran years ago. I am very not squeamish about using Israeli power. Uh, but I think that our language needs to be much more conciliatory. Uh, we need to convey to the Middle East that we're not an isolated island. This language that we use where Israel is a villa in the, in the, in the jungle, that's not, that's not helpful. Mm -hmm. in, 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 because we're staying there. This is, this is where I live. I don't only live in the state of Israel, I live in the Middle East. And you know, a lot of, a lot of Jews who move to Israel, especially from the West, don't fully internalize that. And you know, yes, I'm moving to the Jewish state, but I'm also moving to the Middle East. Yes, you're absolutely and, uh, right. And so I live in the Middle East. The Middle East is, is literally on the next hill across from my living room. Yes. And by the way, is, is, the non-Jewish, the non-Israeli Middle East, a jungle? Well, um, I'd say that that's one, one aspect See, that's of the, the Middle East. That's the problem. But, yes, but it's, it's, there's, it's a world. It's a world and it's a civilization. Now, it's a civilization in, in, in active decline and disintegration. Yes, but, and there's an element of that civilization that wants you gone. Not an element, a, 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 a very strong element that wants me gone. Of course. Of oh, course. Well, I, I know you, where I live. Okay. You I know what I'm facing. You know, with your mind and heart, you're in the ultimate impossible position as an Israeli Jew. Yes, but, but many of us are. Yes, you just, you are the quint you represent the quintessential ide idealistic Jew committed to, to a sense of Jewish fairness, a Jewish sense of justice. As you say, we will pursue peace. And at the same time, you're not blind. And you understand how the reality that Israel faces, that surrounds you, engulfs you, and wants you, I say gone. They want you destroyed. They want no Israel anywhere. Yes. It's, not, it's not about yes. Yes. Divide, sharing the land somehow with a different oh, border. Yes, absolutely. I would say, but I, I wouldn't say they, because they is a, very, is a very big word. Many, many of my neighbors in the Middle East actively want to see me gone. Yes. Uh, my model for how Israel needs to behave in the Middle East comes from the biblical patriarch Jacob. When Jacob was confronting Esau, he returns to the land after being in exile, and he hears that his brother Esau, who has uh, his reasons for being angry with him, is, is, is approaching with an army. And Jacob divides his camp. Remember? Right? Vividly. Okay. So one part of the camp is, is um, he, he, he designates as, the, this, you're the peace camp. You're going to present gifts to, to Esau, Esau. And the other camp, you're the war camp. You, you prepare for war. If. And uh, as a contingency plan, the war camp in Israel always needs to be 
ready mm -hmm. because war can break out tomorrow mm -hmm. on our southern border with Hamas, on our northern border with Hezbollah, Islamic State on the Golan Heights, Islamic State in the Sinai Desert, Iran hovering uh, in, in the background, uh, and the, the nuclear danger has by no means disappeared. And I believe that sooner or later, Israel is going to have to deal with the terrible consequences that the Obama administration bequeathed to us with that, that deal of appeasement. So I am very, my, my eye is always on these two camps. And they're both indispensable. And, and to, to, to be in the Middle East means you always have to have your finger on the trigger. But it also means realizing that I am fated to live in this region hopefully forever, whatever forever means on this planet. And, and that, that means that I also have the obligation to actively look for partners. Do they, do they exist? Yes. How many exist? We don't know. Okay, this is the last, your last statement. You're not going to tell me, you're going to talk right to the JBS audience. It's the Six Day War, the 50th anniversary. What do you want people to think and feel? And what's your wish for us and the, and the audience as we celebrate the Six Day War? So my, my uh, wish for American Jews is that you and we in Israel will know how to balance gratitude and sobriety. Gratitude for the extraordinary victory that we won in 67, that was a gift of the unity of the Jewish people. Gratitude for being the generation that lives with, 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 with Jerusalem back under, under uh, Jewish sovereignty. With all the complications, and I'm a citizen of Jerusalem, I know the problems. Nevertheless, simple gratitude. Gratitude for the fact that, that, that if you're on the left, you, can, you, you have the luxury of moral anguish because Israel survives, because Israel is strong. Simple gratitude. Uh, and gratitude, and, on, and what I would ask for the right, is sobriety. The annual dance with big Israeli flags through the Muslim quarter in Jerusalem on Jerusalem Day is, to my mind, unnecessary. It's, it's, it's provocative. It's, 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 it's a kind of hysteria. And, and when I say sobriety, it means recognizing that the redemption is not here yet. And, and the fact that we are ruling over the lives of another people should, should force us into some sense of introspection. And so the left needs more gratitude. The right needs more sobriety. Do I love you? I love you <laughs> so much. You know, well, Mark, I really, oh, I, it's, it's just a this. delight to you're, be with you. You're out so. of this world. Kol so. Tuva you just keep you. plugging away, writing away. I'm, I'm thrilled for you that the Light Dreamers will now be in Hebrew, and it'll be interesting to see what the reaction is if, by those who I haven't will. read it yet in English. <laughs> but keep writing, keep speaking. There's no Thank one you. like you. Thank you for being here. Yossi Klein Halevi, brilliant journalist, author, analyst, commentator, one of the most brilliant on the world Jewish scene today. And again, his 2013 classic is entitled Like Dreamers, the story of the Israeli paratroopers who reunited Jerusalem and divided a nation. You know, usually it takes a generation or two for a book to become a classic. This is a classic immediately. And I hope if you haven't read it, whether you read it in English or Hebrew, you pick it up. It widens and broadens understanding and appreciation. And what better time as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Six Day War. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the things you heard Yossi or I say on this edition of the Chaim. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, or tweet me. I look forward to hearing from many of you. Until the next time. I'm Mark Golub, the Chaya, my friends, to life.
Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.